before we start, you know, because um, who of you have been here for several days participating? Yes. Okay. Good. Yeah. You know, I would like to ask you, and I don't mind if the others join you, first to give an applause for those who organized this whole event. And secondly, about 10% of this for Mulat, who just wrote his poem yesterday. <laughs> Um, and sometimes this is even accompanied by violence, uh, 
uh, committed by the police. Um, and I'm quite aware that this is a, a rather extreme example, but I think that uh, what is happening now in Greece, okay, there are other circumstances, it's quite extreme, but it really shows the face of racial profile and what can happen if, if it escalates. And the scope of the actions that are now implemented in Greece, they clearly reveal the implications for individuals of racial profiling. And the indications were very clear to me. They were creating distrust, not only towards the police, but always also towards the state. Um, and it was eventually creating a lot of skepticism among African migrants about their possibilities in Greece, but also about what the government could eventually do for them. So it deepens the gap. And that's exactly what we have been speaking about as well amongst ourselves. Um, so it's not long ago that I came back from Greece and I was convinced that this was absolutely not something that I would find, find in the Netherlands. But I was quite shocked when, I, when we were starting to speak about this subject and it appeared something that is happening in, in the Netherlands as well. Maybe it's not officially implemented by, by the government, but um, it appeared that it is dormant and that it exists as a practice uh, by the police. We have seen videos uh, of it and stuff like that. Um, so maybe even the, the police is doing this unconsciously, but still it's creating the, the, the previously mentioned uh, problems among the populations uh, that are targeted. Uh, and again, I do not want to accuse the Dutch police of doing the same as the, the Greek police, but I think it's very important to to mention this subject anyway. Um, so, ethnic profiling is often presented as a, a pre prevention. Uh, we search the people in order to make society more, uh, more safe and more secure. But we would like to turn it around. We think that it is uh, increasing insecurity, not only because of its, an itself reinforcing argument. Of course, if you will search, search more black people, you will find more black people in jail. That's quite a logical thing. Uh, so it reinforces itself and then it gives, it gives the native population, uh, it, it confirms the stereotypes that might exist in the native population. But secondly as well, it creates a sentiment of insecurity among uh, those who are targeted. So ethnic minorities for instance. Um, they do not feel protected by the police. They are, and they are feeling skepticism amongst themselves, and again, it deepens the gap. So we really want this not to happen. That's our main conclusion. And therefore, I would like to make two um, suggestions, especially to the members of Parliament, of course, uh, for your agenda of action. Uh, and we would like you to take that into consideration, of course. Um, and the first thing is that we would like to demand for an in-depth investigation what exactly is happening in the Netherlands. So we, we got the impression that something is going on as well, maybe not as obvious as in Greece, but maybe it exists in a more dormant or more concealed um, way in the Netherlands. So we would like to have an in-depth investigation, and not only among the police, of course, but we would like to see included in this um, investigation as well, the people who are targeted. So how does it make them feel? And secondly, I think that's important as well, we would like you to, to ask if there would be a possibility to develop a training course for police officers. Not only to make them realize uh, that they shouldn't do it, but, it, but why they shouldn't do it. So we would like to clarify them um, that, that there's much more damage done um, then it prevents something. Um, yeah, and that's what uh, what we asked for. So I would re re really like to thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you for your talk, on this event, and I was also uh, uh, interested to hear about your clinic experience and the experiences that you uh, uh, shared while being and doing the debate. Um, your proposals are very interesting. Uh, concerning the second on uh, um, yeah, making people aware of the of the implications as a police of the force and police is very interesting. I also know uh, policy that's already existed here. So maybe it would be an interesting uh, idea to combine also your proposals, but now I'm worried.
expensive than it is. But I know that there's already a, um, a learning community about um, diversity and how to deal with the diverse um, society that it is for the police. So it would be very interesting to see how it could match with your proposal. Yeah, thank you for your speech. Um, before I was a member of parliament, I was a member of the city council of this city, of the city of Leiden. And we had a debate on how to do uh, preventative searches because the mayor said we need this instrument, we need to search the banks of the people who are going out. Uh, and we had a big debate on how to prevent racial profiling, and uh, our council came up with a very simple solution, uh, which is that if the police wants to do a search, they can do it. But they have to pick a number up front, uh, and they can only pick the, 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 for example, every fifth person uh, going through the gate uh, to search the, to search their lands. Uh, which is, uh, I think, as far as I know, it's still working in the city of Leiden, and it works, uh, it works well because it gives the, the police a very clear thing, a clear task to do, um, and they can do it. Um, the problem of racial profiling is, is quite a, a big problem, especially if you look at the capital city. Um, there are more and more police who are from ethnic minorities themselves, uh, and basically they are saying on the basis of their experience, uh, I know who to search, uh, and I know if I'm in this, this area and I see those of those people coming, I will search them. Uh, and that's a, that's a form of racial profiling which they feel is not very bad. Uh, and that's the problem, uh, because it's a, it's an attitude change that it needs to happen, because they have to realize that it is a problem. Um, besides the Amnesty International report, there was also an American television lady, uh, and they sent in a group of white young people and a group of ethnic uh, uh, young people in the neighborhood, and they were just hanging around. They were not doing anything. Yeah. They were eating Chinese food, I think, something very random. Yeah. Uh, and, and the group, uh, which had people with uh, different ethnicities in it, I was visited so and so many more times by the police than the other group was. Yeah. So it is a huge stuff. So thank you for your speech and your suggestions. Thank you. Yes. Uh, I'm not an expert on the uh, police force right now and the way they treat uh, ethnic profiling. So I guess I, I'm sorry, but I know that in the general setting of participation and uh, also to counter discrimination, participation is very much needed uh, from the police force and from the Law, rule of law, to really uh, uh, implement their policies in a good way, but also from you, uh, the, the people themselves, us, all of us actually, to um, feedback also to the rule of law and the, 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 the politicians to what's going on in society, really. If you're being really discriminated, there's people there's place you can go to, like the discriminated Article 1, and it's very important to report and to take well, responsibility also so we can see what's going on. Every year there will be, there's a report on all the discrimination cases that are filed. Sitting here is very empowered in uh, acknowledging other people uh, to make a change if, if something's wrong. So, yeah. Okay, to, to make it more concrete, do I hear the suggestion that people here, I mean, the police should be trained, that's what you said, but that people also here, people like us, should be trained to become better observers of, say, negative and in profile. I would make it more concrete and say that if you feel you are the subject of ethnic profiling and discrimination in any way, report as soon as possible. Yeah, and there's a regional uh, place you can go to, to yeah, file, and then your case will be taken very seriously. Can I ask the question? What extent do you think? government is responsible in informing and encouraging people to actually um, report uh, discrimination, for instance. Uh, and my question derives on the fact that I noticed that many people who feel uh, uh, discriminated against, uh, that they don't necessarily have the tendency to report it as well. Just, I just would like to ask the audience, you can just squeeze it uh, to be checked uh, because I'm, 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 I have black fit for that. So I, I, I reported the uh, uh, people and uh, nothing happened. Uh, in fact, they say it was just, uh, just a routine uh, check yeah. and uh, that, that was it. Yeah. Until, until now, I didn't get anything back to that. Uh, so it's my experience. Yeah. If a friend of mine, uh, he was from uh, Slovakia and uh, 
they know him just to get in and then it's, uh, in, in the Brussels airport they say, okay, you have to show your passport papers and so on and I was like, why? And uh, of course I went to, um, uh, there is some website where you can uh, report to the government if you have been like uh, discriminated and so on. And afterwards, uh, there came a guy who asked me to, to explain the situation. And uh, since then, I never get any reply. And uh, I don't even know if there, there was an action taken about that. So you are discouraged, in fact, to report to this. That's yeah. what you said. Uh, I didn't report it because uh, it was mainly uh, going, when we gone up during nights, I think. Oh, every morning, I said, I don't have to do but it's not because it happened one time, but because it happened like over ten times without lying, you can tell you. But it doesn't, even the police is there, they see it's happening, but at that moment they don't care about um, reason. The only thing they care is security at that moment. So they will tell you, go tomorrow to the police and report it there. Uh, I know many friends of mine who report it, but Talking about total bullshit, I have a question for you. Have you ever had, have you ever tried to have a normal conversation with a policeman? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Can you give an example of that? At those moments, we went to the police and the only thing they said was. Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, I'm not quite aware of the scientific background of everyone who participated in this course, but uh, I'm, I'm sure that some of them would be able to conduct such a research. Absolutely. Yeah. But there are certain methodologies mm -hmm. in which, you know, people from the target group or whatever you want to call it, they're educated to become researchers. Yes. And would you like to include that in your proposal? Of course. Yeah, that's yes. a bit, it's a nasty question because I mean, you never can say no. <laughs> No, but yeah, that's it. We have it uh, Open Society Foundation. Uh, we have done a pilot project in uh, Gouda. It was second wave. Um, and it came from the London experience. And in principle, for a year, the police and the young people worked together. But not in the uniform, and not in the police office, but in the, in the hall or in the youth centre where the young people feel comfortable. And uh, for, I think, 10 sessions for, for a day, they learned actually to get rid of these other stigmas because it's both way. Um, and this really uh, became a very yeah, well researched, so I will send it to you. But my point is, uh, it would be good because many other uh, of such uh, uh, projects are now coming up. I heard it from Amnesty International also. And I think it would be good if they're from out of the ministry or that you maybe ask questions whether best practices could be developed and also upscaled to good trainings at um, uh, the police academy. Because already at the ground in civil society things are going on, but it's not yet seen maybe by policy that uh, I was also asking, are you aware of these kinds of best practices? And in case yes, how are you going to upskill them and also use them in the training of the police? For people to find them to report discrimination. Uh, as far as I know, the government police, if you go to a discrimination uh, um, point, how you say, um, you can do your report anonymously uh, and they will take it into consideration uh, even if you do it anonymously. Yes. Um, so those things are in place and we're trying to get them out there. The government can only do so much. Um, so I don't know if, if that's necessary, uh, but I do think your suggestion to do research is very good and if it would be research done by, by the target groups themselves, so they report the data, they report their experiences, uh, for example, via an app anonymously, very easily, and then you put together a large amount of data in a short amount of time, uh, so that would be something we could do. Is that, um, we have now seen willingness of uh, important people <laughs> uh, that are in the place to, to do something, um, to change something about this. And we have heard that there are already a lot of initiatives. So that's, I think for us, will be very uh, yeah, convenient to hear. Um, and I think that for me personally, nothing new came up during the discussion. Uh, 
So I just would like to thank the audience uh, for attending. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Mr. Michelle. Was that good? <laughs> but I was already so the first time I remember speaking in a microphone and my hand was trembling and I said, okay, uh, leave it. Uh, I don't want to make a point anymore. That was my first moment ever in a microphone. Um, so I don't know how, how many times you did it before, but you sound like a professional, so uh, I would... I would uh, uh, well, uh, I'm very, very good to here, so... Wow. Uh, yeah. Says something about the training. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I hear ten things. And so I would say very good to know that. To the, to, the, to the audience, there were some comments made in the end, uh, for example, about education. I think in Holland, everybody knows discrimination is wrong. Uh, so we can educate people more, but they will just know that it's wrong. And they will still know. The problem is experience. Uh, people don't have many positive experiences uh, when it comes to people from other ethnicities. And most people just are uh, you know, friends with only uh, Dutch people, white people. Uh, and that's the basic problem. Uh, so that's, that's the thing we have to solve. Um, maybe one final comment on politics, because you might get the impression that it's very easy to solve things in politics. Um, but discrimination is a very contentious issue nowadays in Dutch politics. Because as soon as the, the word is raised, uh, there is especially one party, the populist party, uh, who will uh, seize the opportunity and, and make it worse, basically. Uh, so sometimes we choose not to raise things, uh, at least they are not made worse by, by the populist party. Uh, so this is something you have to be aware of. A month ago, there was a report by the Council of Europe on the basis of discrimination in Holland. And most parties decided to pass on it and not to comment on it, even though it was a very serious report and should take it seriously. Just not to give them a platform again to, to say what, 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 what things they have to say. Good job. Um, and I also like that you said that you counter arguments already what could be the criticism in life. Isn't our society more secure if we do a personal profile? So I like that you also thought from the other end. Um, and in your suggestions, I, I really like them, but I uh, propose that you also take into account the power and, and potential people themselves. So, so sorry, yeah. the potential people themselves to raise the issue rather than only looking at politics, which is very contentious this issue, uh, or the government, but seeing together as a group of people what you can do to raise the issue rather than besides raising the issue here. Yeah. So I'm looking forward to see what you. Uh, Now for Lisa, give her an applause, she will take the floor. And we have two panel members, Yinka Akiyawade, he's from the Africa Study Center, he's sitting here. Uh, first of all, I'd like to give you a small example of myself. When I came out uh, after a week, I just turned 18, and um, there's a very nice system the Dutch have. It's called the ESK, the ISK. Um, it's mostly for youth that have a high school background that come here and get integrated. But uh, that was a problem for me because um, I was 18 but still in high school. In the Dutch uh, system, the age is different uh, like from Africa or other countries. Here you go a step higher, like my sister, she's eight and she's already in grade five. While as in Africa, someone of eight years would be like in uh, grade one or something. So when they come here, um, it's good that the Dutch uh, weighs your certificate, but also doesn't take your age that much into consideration. So uh, these people are actually discouraged from working and go mostly to uh, lower jobs to get money and instead of pursuing education, which is actually a very, very important thing in their stay here. And, um, uh, so I think uh, uh, what I would say would be a very good um, proposition would be to find a better way of validating the certificates um, and taking their age into account. Um, going to my second point is about um, internship. Um, I talk about internship because not only me but um, my friends from Tilburg and many other places have the same problem. Um, the main problem is finding an internship has become really hard because you mostly have to get networking. It doesn't just happen like calling companies and saying, hey, can I just come and work for you? Um, and mostly for migrants, African migrants, they have a problem because they don't have that much network here and the school doesn't help them that much. And these people without internship, they can't get their certificate. And what does this lead to? It leads to school dropouts. And school dropouts, we all know, don't contribute to our society. They become a burden to the Dutch government. 
they get into um, social welfare, what we know as the outcarry. But um, actually, if we lower this number by finding alternatives like school dropouts, finding a way to validate their certificate, or in my case, like migrants uh, like me, I don't have a dad or a mom who has good networks, so I have to go the hard way to find internship by helping me or other migrants like me to contribute a lot to our education system. Um, so, um, talking about that, um, uh, these people mostly drop out and are being idle or jobless and isolated mostly. And when they're isolated, what does it result to? We all know crime, violence. Uh, isolated people have a lot of anger, a lot of revenge in themselves. They hate the system, and hating the system becomes you become automatically what against the system. So I think it's a very crucial issue. And most internships, I would say, are also um, you don't get any compensation. You work, you work for free for five, six months. I mean, how are students supposed to work for five, six months without having any money? These are mostly people like me. I have a part-time job, but if I go into internship, I have to leave my part-time job, work for free for about five, six months, and if I live alone, how can I pay for my food? How can I pay for my uh, rent? How can I pay for so many things? It's going to be really, really tough. This will cause me to lend money, and if I become a dropout, it becomes a very huge debt on my on, on myself. Um, and for people who live, you would say people live with their parents, they have a problem, but mostly migrants have lower income, so these students can actually sometimes be a source of income to the family, and if they leave that, they go into internship, it becomes a very big problem. Um, and this is a very big issue because I read it on the magazine and it has uh, appeared so many times on the newspapers. And uh, for this, I think um, I have a very good proposition, but it might sound a bit uh, biased. But I think it would be good if the Dutch government imposed a quota or a law that um, uh, makes companies give some sort of compensation to all people who follow internships in their in their companies. It doesn't have to be a large amount of money or anything, but some uh, kind of compensation. Because when I go to my uh, third last point, that is about study financing, when it stops, it becomes even a very big problem actually traveling to the internship place because you have no way uh, that is the, uh, the car that you use to get free uh, public transport. And um, as I said, when this uh, study finance stops, it becomes a very big problem. Uh, especially, as I said, for my hands or for students with a part-time job, uh, with, a, with no job and with no car to travel, uh, you become stranded. And most students don't live in the city that they study. Like in my example, I live in uh, Amsfort and I go to school in Utrecht. So if I have no way, it becomes a problem, and uh, which will actually uh, become an obstacle to my study. And again, I say that it will lead to dropping out. Um, so what I meant to say is, um, uh, I think that the Ministry of Foreign Affairs um, can better deal with the issue of uh, having ways, other ways of dealing with uh, certificate validation of uh, migrants, especially uh, high school students who come up, who come with um, no valid, validated diploma of the high schools. Um, because mostly what happens in camps, in example of migrant refugees, they are um, just led into learning the language once a week, and that is really uh, not sufficient to continue with the study. So I'm uh, giving again an example of myself. I could not go to school, so I just had to stay in the camp and only um, learn the language once in a week until I was uh, waiting to get the house. And after which I got, again, I had to follow only language courses. And um, the, I think uh, Nika, who is um, from the diaspora from the, the development, I think, um, uh, can also help uh, you for validations because I think this organization has connections with uh, other uh, diaspora youth from different places who have uh, different uh, certificates and I think getting ideas from these people can have a better system and I thank you all for your participation. Uh, on the other hand, you have some very, I think, interesting propositions to the uh, employers society in the sense that what's in it for us in order to, to have these internships. And you also address the certification in the sense that it's okay if you have the cert certificate. But what will I buy with it? What, what, what type of entrance will I have for my, for my future? Um, and lastly, you are 
directly and indirectly aiming at the government in the sense that part of the solution has to come from part from government, which is a very old-fashioned way to, to treat government. As you know, in the, the, the Dutch politics, uh, the actual policy is that we are living in a participatory society and the government is retreating and is with citizens and have to come up with their own solution. This is the broad aim at, uh, of the government, which isn't much helpful for your case. But nevertheless, I would like to, to respond to, to, to two issues. Um, don't underestimate the initiatives that you're taking and the experiences you're building right now. Um, don't, uh, you, you aim that you, are, you, you have a job apart from your study, which is necessary to finance your study. I think value that, 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 that job and try to get out of it as much as possible. In that sense, you as a representative of, of, of African society, of, of the diaspora, are not different than most of the, 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 your, your uh, colleagues, co-students, who need to have a job in order to survive and, and aim for the future. So don't try to make the, the best of it and try to network as much as possible. That is a, a one of the avenues. In the second place, um, you, your proposition is, is valid. I think employers are being uh, triggered by the our Dutch Ministry of uh, Education. Unfortunately, working for the Dutch Ministry of Foreign Affairs, there is little we can do to aim at your specific fate because we are aiming with our policy in the, 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 the most of the, 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 the regions outside of the Netherlands, which we are trying to influence and support your, your, the youth. Uh, but we are in discussion as a government, because this is not, a, 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 the, the Dutch government is very aware about the youth bulge and the risks which you refer to. And I think one of the latest propositions of our colleague, uh, of our Ministry of uh, Education, uh, and Mrs. Dusselmark, is that she's actually proposing Dutch uh, uh, education institutes to be responsible for the internships of the students. You see, there is little that our, our institutes can do for us to facilitate ourselves. There is a proposal, a law proposal, which is actually, actually being discussed as if to in enhance or give a, a major mandate to education uh, institutes, which is also a part of the solution, because it is the dialogue between the education providers uh, the actors like yourself and the employment, which have to come up with uh, aiming at these, uh, reaching these, these type of solutions. So I think your proposal is interesting, and these are the points I'd like to refer to. Thank you. So, I will mean, listen to him right now. I want to continue from where he said you should not limit what you have in you uh, right now. One of the things, one of the opportunities, I work in the African Studies Center. One of the opportunities we offer for internship is for prospective interns to just turn in the application, send us your CV, tell us what you want to do, what you can do, and then uh, whoever is interested among the member of staff can pick up the intern. But that, that is at the most direct level, and it is a bit uh, sort of limited right now to the pool of prospective interns that are out there. So, but the opportunity is there, and it's one of the things which you could explore. I like your presentation or your way of presentation in a particular style that you identified three problems and you identified a band of youths that are likely to be affected by these problems, you said age 18 to 23. Then you went ahead to say, yeah, if there's problems about validation of certificates, about financing, about internships. Then there will be issues of difficulties arising from dropouts and to be idle, being jobless. People who hate the system, which you further again to our previous point, profile. That last one which you even add to some of these problems which you raised. So it's, um, we will still go ahead with some of the points you will raise. However, I will still not want you to limit yourself by telling us, saying, well, whatever proposition you are making may be partial because it's coming from you. No. Tell us the proposition. 
don't limit yourself. Let limit, limit to the government or to the academics to sort it out. Say it. Okay. And then an example is that we, we are living here as African youth. I'm African youth. I'm studying law at the University of Amsterdam and I'm doing a part time job. And this Chris said, yes, this part time job you can use it, but I'm keener. I can do nothing with those part time jobs. There's no network coming from that part time job. But I want to do an internship. But when I do an internship, I don't get money to, 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 pay, my, to pay my rent, to pay the bills, to do all things. It's really a problem. So, when those part, uh, internships are, are paid, I, I'm, I'm, there is a chance for me to do that, to do that uh, instead of going to lose, to look for a job that will not, well, where I will not benefit at all for, for all. So it's really a problem, and, and I really want, uh, really want you to think we really with a better solution instead of saying, no, it's okay, it's not okay. <laughs> Point about the lady said that well, what about you know, jobs? Jobs don't help. Don't, jobs don't give them. So when I came, um, I came in contact with the. So um, when I came, I came into, into contact with the UIF, that is um, a sort of organization that um, finances or helps uh, students, um, mostly refugee students, uh, to continue their studies. And um, I was privileged to an application to be accepted, so they are actually currently paying for my um, study here and everything, but um, that, that's one in a million. There are lots of other people uh, who also can't get this chance uh, due to uh, certificate validation problems because um, I used to, I was uh, from high school and um, did not have a diploma, but through a test I was able to be accepted by them. And mostly they accept people with higher education. But as I gave the example of students between 18 and 23, these are the students who are in high school in Africa, for example, but when they come here, it becomes difficult. They mostly go for something actually low below the level where they are able to achieve something higher in return. You spoke about uh, uh, don't have your certificate. Well, of course, people build competences, but it needs to be validated. It can be validated by yourself, but it's not recognized by the labor markets. Um, so, talking about dropouts, they still have their competences, but uh, yeah, who is validating that and is that recognized by the labor market? And I was wondering, you will oversee many countries and education programs, and especially in certain countries there are a lot of dropouts, street children, and uh, do you have any example or uh, of policy or program in which they are already validating competences, why it is not yet an official exam, but at least that those uh, kids or those children or young people can go to the labor market and go, can show an alternative uh, yeah, exam or at least validation of their competences. Um, in most developing countries, I am referring myself only specifically to Africa, in most African countries, there are policies uh, being developed or policies uh, implemented to which, which direct themselves to job, to, to, uh, job uh, certification and also to qualification frameworks. The problem is that in spite of the policies which look fabulously and can compare international standards, it is a rather traditional way in which they are implemented. They start at the tertiary level uh, higher education, what are the necessary uh, certifications necessary for jobs to be gained, to be developed when you have, you, when you have, have studied in university? Well, it's been quite impressive. I really appreciate the way, maybe from my own perspective, uh, as an academic, we always like it when uh, the student narrows down, narrows down, until you narrow down, until you can no longer narrow. Now, if you are able to narrow the problem, you identify the crucial areas, you identify the age band, because it's not easy defining the youth. So, if you take the 24, it's into 23, it's into 26, but you give us also a band for which particular problems do occur. So, in that way, I really enjoy your presentation. As for the debate, it's uh, stand up. Yes, this will continue, I'm sure, uh, and in fact, yeah. And uh, I'm willing to see to continue to give my input uh, on a constructive basis.
on how the problems that have been raised here can be solved. Okay. Thank you very much. Please. Uh, I agree. Uh, you were tempted to propose theses which are so abstract that uh, we get lost after two minutes. I think you were very specific. Uh, that also had a repercussion that the debate was very specific, complex specific. Uh, it was the, the debate was very tangible. I think that was, was, was very good. You also succeeded in depicting the state of the migrant student in, in the Netherlands with respect to global challenges. I think that was also a very uh, a realistic uh, perspective. In that sense, you should, you were able to perceive that in an intelligent way. And I think the arguments you proposed were, were quite convincing. In a sense, you, you can hear the, the debate we were having is uh, unfortunately, due to time, a negative, but we could have continued it, could have continued for, for, for a lot longer period. So, okay. Thank you, Christine. Thank you, Christine. Hello everybody, my name is Niki Svita. I'm here at a debate organized by IDEA. Um, I'm the next speaker. Uh, I'm going to talk about employment and uh, obstacles African youth are, uh, are, 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 are meeting when they want to get a job in uh, Europe, in, Netherlands, in the Netherlands. We had like three days of um, debating um, a training when we learned to debate, to communicate, how to stand, how to present ourselves, and it really uh, was really good uh, because I never debated uh, before, so I really felt confident to stand here to talk uh, about very important issues. Um, everybody started, I think, Friday, I started Sunday. A friend of mine, Danny, called me and said, Nikki, you really have to participate, it's really wonderful, and they're really talking about important topics for African here in the Netherlands and Africa in Europe. I want to thank Anna uh, Ruland, uh, Veronica and all the, all the others who learned how to really to debate and improve our communication skills. Before I came here, I didn't do any debating at all, and now I'm standing here at the stage. So uh, it, it shows me, really like um, Joanne said, it shows me really the the excellent trainers, how, how excellent, excellent the trainers were. Um, and I want to thank everybody who accepted the invitation of, uh, for the people from the government, but also other NGOs here in the Netherlands. You're really showing that this topic also is very important for you too, and you really want to come together to see which solution we can, uh, we, we, we can uh, we, we can create, we can come up, so uh, there will be an improvement of the inclusion of African youth. Uh, I'm going to talk about the um, employment of African youth. Uh, in the video we had a lot of uh, background inf information and reading it I was really not discouraged but I was really, um, it, 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 I felt really kind of, wow, is it really that bad? When I see, <laughs> I see um, the numbers, I see in a time of economic crisis where the youth unemployment is already that high, but the African youth unemployment is much higher. So it makes you think, why, why is the difference so big between those two groups? Why, are, why um, do migrant youth have more difficulties securing a job than non-migrant peers? And in a group debating, we found uh, two, uh, uh, two reasons why, why this could be um, the problem. That is, uh, one is disc uh, discrimination, and the other because of uh, the view of companies towards African youth. Uh, first, I want to talk about uh, discrimi discrimination. Um, in my previous uh, not attack, but the point that I made, I felt like I was attacking the people sitting here, but it, it wasn't attacking, it was just showing the reality we African youth have to face every day. I have an example of a friend of mine who applied for a job 
three months ago uh, with a good um, uh, good grades. Um, she did internships, everything, but they um, they she got um, a letter back when, when they say thank you for uh, for your application, but you're not the right candidate, and we wish you really uh, um, great good luck to uh, to your further search for a job. And she was discouraged. She said, "Wow, I really want the job. I really want to work for that company because I felt this is." The place I want to develop myself as a human being. Um, we said, "Oh, no problem. You can look for another job. It's, it happens all the time. In this time, to get a job for a white, a black, it's the same. You don't get a job." But she was feeling like, "No, no, no. Wait a minute. I, it doesn't feel right." So she sent uh, another application and uh, with uh, the same CV, same motivation letter. But with a different name, she used a Dutch name this time, and and you will see she got a reply. The reply was, "Thank you for your application. We want to uh, invite you to uh, to uh, to see if we if this is really the place that um, uh, this if, if we want to invite you to uh, talk about us and to really meet you and yeah to get to know each other." So this shows the the part that I'm facing that we are facing as African youth. So it's not about we are not qualified enough. It's not about we don't want to go to school, we go to school. We work very hard, but in the end, when you just apply and they see your name, it's like, mm -mm, not today, maybe in the future, maybe when the, eco the economics will be better, the economics, uh, uh, economics price will be over, and that's not fair. It's really morally wrong, I think. Um, that's why I want to start about the discrimination part. Another part is the view of companies towards Africans. The, the, the view of uh, companies um, is it's, it's really negatively. But th this doesn't have to be like that. Um, I want to say uh, employers, we embrace the challenges of ethnically diff uh, diverse workforce uh, will really uh, reap the benefits. Uh, with lower staff turnover, uh, direct financial, financial rewards, and there is a, a certain no, knowledge, a certain know-how, a certain expertise that we African youth we can really contribute at Dutch companies, European companies, like uh, the previous speaker talk, talked about about being a bridge with Africa and Europe. It's there is place for us, but we have to get the opportunity to start those, to start working there. So um, those are the, the two uh, topics I want to discuss and I want to uh, give to you. Um, and uh, for me, they are really relevant because, like I said, I'm still uh, I'm still at school, and when I finish my school, I hope to get a good job when I can de develop myself. And during the break. Um, somebody told me, yeah, the cleaning is really fine, and when they say you can have a network, but when you clean, everybody's gone. So, no network is really bad. So, <laughs> so that's, um, I, I would like to end with a quote that I uh, composed myself. Um, I'm not from a rich continent of poor people. We lost our bonds, then our freedom and our peace in the name of civilization. But we did not lose our strength, nor our voice, and neither our minds. Our perseverance is more precious than gold, diamonds, or cotton. Thank you very much. where the cases are and how we, we can um, effectively attack those cases of discrimination. I heard in the previous, when we talk about security, that people make complaints but it get lost. That's not what we want. We, when people make complaints that something will happen to it, that you can use them. So uh, instead of complaints, I think a research 
uh, implemented from the government will have a uh, more effect on the problem about discrimination, uh, uh, discrimination. And another, uh, another, another idea is um, to really force uh, companies that they have quotas to to um, to to um, to accept African youth. So they they are, they are faced that the African youth can really uh, uh, attribute something in their companies because now it's they are not accepting us, accepting us. So when they are forced from the government, and I think the government can do this because we already do, we call it positive this positive discrimination, and we do it with women, so more women can be also be put in the workplace. So why not with uh, African youth? That's uh, are my um, ideas. Thank you very much. Uh, 
thank you very much. Uh, I received pleasure, especially when you mentioned the example of uh, being cleaning after work.
got the government, um, they did this research and they, like I said, they, uh, they use it for um, to make uh, action plans. So I think there is uh, a need of research in the Netherlands to see maybe or uh, the problem here is a little bit different than in other European um, countries. So uh, when I say research, I really mean research in the Netherlands. I only really like to say to use those features. Tell me we can come to action plan without research. You don't. You really think we can't come to uh, formulate any actions mm -hmm. without further research? I think um, research are very important, like uh, tackling discrimination, tackling um, racism, tackling things like that. You really need to find to to see first what is the problem and who are who are facing this problem problem before you go uh, create action plans. Because in the end, you will have action plans. One not connected with the real problems, and we don't want that. That's why I think we should. Uh, um, actually, the point that you raised was, was a very interesting one, and especially if you talk about South Africa, the, the quota system has been in operation ever since '94, and it has been with, with very many mixed results. It's not to say that did not work, but to say that it has presented South Africa with a solution to the problem is also not the case. So, it, it, uh, although it's, uh, I realize that in a, uh, a presentation of 10 minutes you can't, not, uh, can't elaborate on an issue like that, but it would have been more powerful probably if, if you would have given a bit of context to that solution of, of the quota system. Um, I was just wondering if we could put a little bit twist on the quota system so that instead of uh, trying to force the companies to take a certain percentage of uh, minorities, then we encourage them that if they take so many, then they get some kind of benefit from whether from the government or some kind of subsidy or something. So we make a twist on it to encourage them. Instead of Twisting their arms to encourage them so that if you take this kind of people mm, so much, then you get some something back apart from the fact that, of course, they also you know produce a lot. And, and the fact is, when a company has got a diverse you know uh, brain, then there are also many ways of solving problems, and it's also much better. So let's let's kind of you know encourage the, the, the companies to that's. Also, the work of um, 
and the government, local um, companies and universities and media to change the, the image because, um, like I, I say in my, in my quote, I'm not from a poor uh, continent of uh, which people know. When you go to Africa, you will see a lot of uh, wonderful things there. So it, it, it's, it's just not true. Like I said, when we embrace uh, diversity in companies, we will see that how much Africans can contribute in, uh, in companies. So it's really true. It's really can change. Thank you for giving me the place. We are talking about employment. And then um, you're talking about the siege and you're talking about quota. I would like to, to ask what is the real action when you are talking about the, uh, the quota? Because I would like to go in a company with my capacity and not because we have that, that we have quota. And then I have two examples. When I, I, I went to one uh, outside bureau and they want someone to speak. Dutch, English, and French. And I said, oh, this is mine. Yeah. And when I go there, they said to me, no, you have to speak French without accents. And I said to this woman, we have first to speak French together. She didn't speak French. So it was very difficult. Because she don't know if I will speak French with accent or not. It was just a, uh, a, a, a way to say, we don't want to. And then I have three, three um, uh, experience. When I went to other housing bureau, I found a the job there, and they say, "No, we, you want this job? This is good, but there are Dutch people who want this way, and we, we, we are wanting, we want, to, we will give it to Dutch people." So it was a good matter to say to me, "We don't want you." So I, I'm, face, I'm facing this every time. So, and and then I have to to find my consultants who say. If you stay unemployed, so you don't want to be integrated. Yeah. If you stay unemployed, you don't want to be integrated, and so I will be punished after. When we take all this combination of things, what is uh, an advice you could give to me when you say about Zubizich, when you say about Koda, and I want to go in a society with my own capacity, with my own uh, capabilities? What do you already find? Uh, you, you understand your argument? Yeah, I understand the argument. Uh, we say short term measures and long term measures. I think we should give him an applause because yeah. it's a very yeah. exciting. Yeah.
having young people taking matters into their own hands. And what I have seen from last Friday, when we started, and the people came in, they were a bit shy, they were reluctant to speak in front of an audience, and I have seen an incredible commitment from themselves to develop their skills and to improve their own situation. So I have seen a huge improvement in this. They have become more comfortable, more articulate, and more willing to advocate for their own causes. So I think that's a great lesson that they have taken with us for themselves from this weekend and the competition we have today. Now, lastly, of course, with the competition, there are prizes to be awarded. So what will happen now is that the panel members will deliberate who of the three speakers we just heard did their best in terms of advocating their project and in terms of debating in general. So with that being said, um, the prizes afterwards will be awarded at the reception at the same place where we had the coffee and the lunch. Abdul Kadir Mohamed. Make his bitter. haven't missed anyone, otherwise shame on us. Um, we will provide you in any case if we have not had your year with your certificate. Um, but in that case, very much sorry. I hope you all enjoyed it. This is officially the end of the public part of this project um, and we hope to stay in contact with all of you. We will share the pictures and the videos that are being made um, and we look forward to seeing you in the future. Thank, Thank you all very much. Yes, um, hi, it's me again, Nikki Shvita from Angola. Um, I won. <laughs> I won um, the debate on uh, inclusion of African youth. Uh, it's really wonderful. I didn't expect it at all because it was like my first uh, debate uh, tournament and also the first time I really uh, debated with other people. So um, it really shows the. Um, communication skills we learn from our trainers and uh, I think ID did a good work um, to allow African youth to come together and to do this and yeah thank you for the judges who voted for me and uh, hopefully to see you next time again. That's good. The topic is quite relevant in a sense in what way are African youth to be included uh, in the dreams and perspectives they achieve uh, uh, for reaching a, a job and to making a max of their uh, education uh, being uh, offered here in the Netherlands. I think that is a very relevant uh, question, which is not exclusively for African uh, youth, but for all youth in, in the Netherlands. But I think the, the, the issue is good that, that the, the position of, of migrant youth, African youth, is being specified in, uh, in the Netherlands and what the challenges are they are facing. So in that sense I, I've, I've followed two uh, debate rounds and I think in both rounds there are some very challenging and inspiring theses being proposed and the debate is quite heated and isn't over yet. But I think that there are a lot of arguments which are uh, uh, 
uh, included, which could be used in order to give some more confidence and uh, instruments for the uh, youth here in the Netherlands. Uh, one of the beauty of the program here is that it offers an opportunity for African students and also all other students to share ideas about special problems which um, African students are facing. It is important in the real sense that many of the problems we talk about, whether from education, whether about security, whether about financing, we talk about it so much in our homes, we talk about it so much among our friends, we do not talk about it in a systematic way to gather information in a way to present and look for solutions to these problems. Uh, on a relevant theme, of course, the inclusion of African youth in Europe, but at the same time also uh, important for the competitive element of uh, the debate. And um, um, if, if I look at what has been presented so far, then uh, our hopes for the future uh, can be certainly with this particular generation of debaters because the confidence with which they stand on the, on the platform and make their point is impressive to note. So debate is actually a crucial tool to communicate and to participate in democracy. What we see last year is that in the Netherlands especially, but also in Europe, African young people are excluded. Um, but they don't know where the avenues are to bring their message across. So with this program, African Inclusion of Youth in Europe, um, we want to train the young people who actually have the brains and the knowledge and the, and the academic skills, but who lack uh, at least a little bit uh, the, 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 the tools to debate about it, to debate about what they know and what their opinions are. So what we have done, we have recruited about 35 young, brilliant uh, African uh, people, either from university or just uh, people who are unemployed. And for three days they got a training in the Rode Hood in Amsterdam. And we trained them mainly on how can you structure your speech, how can you build up your argument, but also what is very important, how can you listen to each other in order to counter-argue about what the other said and to come to a higher level with the debate. So this is the training we gave them and today we are together uh, to have a policy debate with some of the politicians and the policy makers and experts. And we have asked the whole audience uh, to see whether we can come up with uh, an agenda for action. Because we believe the debate, the debate is a policy debate and it's actually also a tool for advocacy if you develop an agenda for action as a result of the debate. So that's also why I in the beginning announced that today at the day of the right of the child, which is actually today, the 20th of November, we kick off the campaign, inclusion of African young people in Europe. And this campaign will be driven by the young people who we have trained and their peers and friends and will be based on the agenda which will develop today. So it's a working policy debate today and so far they have talked about security, about education and we are now waiting for the debate about employment. So we are really looking forward for the agenda but especially also for the commitment of those who have influence in whatever sphere to commit to join this advocacy driven by young people who really experience exclusion or who sort or heard it from their friends or their peers. So thank you very much.